Check, check, check. Hey guys, everybody, welcome to the Christian Hunters of America Predator Hunting Seminar. We're very blessed to have uh, John Stallone as a guest speaker tonight. Any of you guys that are into hunting very much at all, you're going to know who John is. We've been actually trying to get him for quite a while now. But first of all, guys, we're going to start off with a prayer, then we'll do a few announcements and stuff, and uh, then we'll turn it over to John. All right, thank you everybody for uh, joining us tonight, and uh, as we always do, as we start with the prayer. So Lord God, we just, uh, we love you, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord, that we live in uh, the United States of America, Lord, and have this opportunity of freedom to come and talk about hunting, Lord, and have fellowship as we have tonight, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you bless every person that's here tonight, and those that are watching on YouTube, and those that couldn't make it, I ask that you bless their family, Lord, and we also ask for blessing upon our country, Lord, and all the crazy stuff that's going on in the world, Lord, and we just ask that you would just uh, give protection to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Right on. Thank you, Mike. Everybody, welcome. We're glad you're here tonight. I know John's going to put on a great presentation for us. A um, few things, guys. We have got several raffles going on out there. We have got a totally free raffle. Uh, there's a poster out there right as you walk in the door that's got a big QR code on the bottom of it. We're going to be giving away a $100 gift card to either your choice of Sportsman's Warehouse or Ross Outdoors. That's totally free. Just scan that QR code. It'll take you to a site that you just ask you like two questions, and then uh, you're signed up for it. We're going to draw that later this week. Um, we've got a bunch of other raffles going on out there, guys. We have got a Citadel 12-gauge shotgun. Tickets for that are $5 a piece. It's actually set up perfectly for doing varmint calling. Uh, it has sights on it and everything ready to go. We have got a Smith & Wesson 9mm handgun. Tickets for that are only $1 a dollar a piece. Uh, we've also got an electronic varmint call out there. Tickets for that are a dollar. We have two different call packages that have hand calls uh, in it. Um, those tickets are a buck a piece. We also have a decoy, a rabbit decoy, a motion decoy that uh, we're selling tickets for as well. And if you brought the kids tonight, we've got a totally free raffle for the kids. We've got a Daisy Red Rider BB gun. So if you kids have not gotten your tickets for that, make sure you see us out there at the tables and uh, we'll get you that free ticket for that. All of those items will be drawn tonight, guys, other than the QR code. We'll draw that within the next day or two. Um, a little bit about Christian Hunters of America, guys. We are a nonprofit, 501c3 organization. We actually started back in 2001 as a chapter of Christian Bow Hunters of America, and we were called Desert Christian Archers at that time. As we started to grow, we realized that a lot of our membership uh, was not so much into bow hunting. They were into hunting in general and stuff, so we changed our name to Christian Hunters of America. But we do uh, meetings the third Tuesday of every month, and a, a lot of those meetings are actually seminars like the one that we're doing tonight. We do a predator hunting seminar with John Stallone tonight, but we just did a turkey hunting seminar here at Oasis Church. Shout out to Oasis, fantastic church guys. If you're looking for a home church, come check these guys out. They pastor called us up uh, when we missed the turkey hunting seminar and just said, hey, I was looking forward to going to that seminar and I saw you canceled it. And uh, if you guys are interested, um, you know, maybe you guys could do that event over there. And that was during the COVID era. Andy, thank you for providing this opportunity to us. Very blessed uh, to be able to come to this church. They just open up their arms and let us come in here and uh, do our seminars. We also do a lot of family-oriented stuff. We do a big pizza party every June uh, at the other church that we do events at. There is actually a playground for the kids. There's a basketball court. It's all exclusive, so that it's only our kids that are out there using it. And it's a big pizza party in June. That'll be the third Tuesday in June. We have our biggest event of the year is in July. The third Tuesday in July, we do an elk hunting seminar. Uh, we've had over 1,000 people at that event before. It is a lot bigger seminar. That is our biggest event of the year. Come check that out. We'll be sending out information and stuff for that soon. We also are planning to do a deer hunting seminar in October. That will be our first time that we've done an official deer hunting seminar. Um, and we also do a javelina hunting seminar. We do camps. Uh, we take kids hunting. We take kids with cancer hunting. We take vets hunting. And uh, we just have group camps for novice hunters and stuff like that. If you want any more information about that, just talk to anybody that's out there at the raffle table and stuff. And uh, with that, guys, uh, we're going to turn it over. I'm, oh, for, almost forgot about Phoenix Varmint Callers in the back, PVCI, awesome organization. If you're into Varmint Calling, make sure you talk to these guys. These guys have been around for a long time. They're one of the oldest organizations in the state. They do a lot of conservation projects, do a lot of great stuff. So make sure you check them out, too. And with that, guys, we're going to turn it over to our guest speaker, John Stallone.
Thank you. Uh, and I got this uh, awesome Britney Spears style mic going over here. All right. How's everybody doing tonight? Good, good. Let's see if I can get this thing to turn on. Yeah. All right. There we go. All right. So a uh, little bit about myself. Uh, my name is John Sloan, obviously. Uh, I've been hunting since I'm about five years old. Went uh, deer hunting with my dad. It was the first time ever at five. And I don't recommend you do that with your children. Uh, he actually helped me hold the 30-30 and uh, shot my first deer then. Uh, kind of traumatized me a little bit. Not the killing of the deer, but the, the kick of the 30-30. So uh, I want you to think about that as you take your children out. Uh, definitely take them out for the experience, but not uh, necessarily traumatize them with the gun. Um, I run a podcast called Days in the Wild. Uh, talk mostly about big game hunting. Uh, do some predator stuff and some small game, but mostly big game hunting and bow hunting. Um, I've been in outdoor TV since early 2000s. Uh, own the hunting channel online and uh, outdoor writer, written a couple of books, wrote for a bunch of magazines. Kind of got my hands in just about everything <laughs> that has to do with hunting. I'm an outfitter. Um, we, we run just a few hunts a year, take out a small amount of clients, just me and a couple of guides. Uh, do do predator hunts um, and uh, mostly guided coos deer and, and, and elk. But uh, predator hunting and javelina hunting too are, are right up there. Um, I'm also one of the co-founders of Howl for Wildlife, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that first before we get into the elk, or excuse me, to the uh, coyote seminar. Um, Howl for Wildlife was started uh, out of necessity. It, we've been facing a lot of um, like a coordinated attack, basically, in the last couple of years, especially since the political climate has changed. Uh, it's kind of opened the door for a lot of things to, to happen. Uh, where you're seeing a lot of anti-hunting um, legislature come up, a lot of, a lot of bills, and um, even at, you know, at the commission level or, um, or at this, the townships and cities levels across America. So what Halfa Wildlife does is it unites all of us hunters. Um, we have a big problem within the hunting community. Uh, it's, it's even hard to call it a community because of this particular problem. The problem that we have is that a hunter in, let's say, New York that deer hunts doesn't care about a guy in California who bear hunts. And there's that disconnect. We all have, a lot of us have niches. Some of us are generalists and we just love to hunt everything, like myself. I don't, you know, I don't discriminate. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm just as happy to go coyote hunting as I am elk hunting. But there are, elk hunters, there are deer hunters, and there are bear hunters, and so on and so forth. And that, that, that is a problem for us, because when stuff comes up on a bill that is, you know, most of these organizations, these anti-hunting organizations, will go for what we call the low-hanging low fruit. And that's typically going to be bear hunting, lion hunting, bobcat hunting, stuff that we're talking about now, coyote hunting. Uh, although coyote hunting is never really on the bill because, I don't know, it's like one of those things like even, even vegans don't care about killing rats, you know. So, and not that the coyotes are, I don't feel that way about them, but it's got that kind of like that mentality anyway. Um, anyway, so they go for the low-hanging fruit. And what happens is the, the guy in California who lost bear hunting, okay, it's seemingly like it doesn't affect you here in Arizona. Okay, we're here in Arizona, how does that affect me here? Well, we, we all pay into the same, you know, the same pot. And if a guy loses his, uh, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, ability to go hunt in his home state, one, he might come to your state to hunt now, so that affects you. Two, you lost you know, how many thousand people in that state that were hunting, were purchasing licenses, were putting money into, um, 
you know, into the conservation pot, we'll call it, right? You lose that and you're losing voices. And the smaller and smaller our voices get, the less and less we uh, are relevant, okay? And so it's important that we support everybody that hunts legally and support all legal hunting. Um, I'm going to kind of show you a quick little video that we did. This is a Unity video. Um, it kind of gives you like the quick rundown of what how alpha wildlife is, and then I'll touch on a couple more points, and then we'll get right into the uh, Hi, into the coyote. I'm John Stallone. Hi, my name is Jason Phelps. Hi, I'm Robbie Denning with Rockslide. Hi, my name is Aaron Warbritt. Hey, my name is Jermaine Hodge. Hi, my name is Shannon Mobs. Hi, my name is Anthony. Hi, I'm Mark Schmidt. Hi, my name is Adam Miller. Hey guys, Joe here from the Western Bear Foundation. Hey everybody, I'm Johnny Mack. Hi, my name is Brian Sillison from Beyond Rubicon. I want to take a minute to introduce you to a new organization called Howl for Wildlife. Howl for Wildlife. Howl was grown out of the necessity to have a fast acting tool. For a fast acting tool. Fast acting tool to focus the sportsman's voice, us. On issues concerning wildlife management, hunting, and fishing. It's Howl's goal. It is Howl's goal. To it's Howl's goal. It's Howl's goal to shut down any initiative or piece of legislation that doesn't support sound management practices before it makes it to the ballot. And certainly before it reaches the courtroom. We need to start thinking about hunting as a community. We really have to start looking at hunting as a community. We need to start looking at hunting as a community and not just an individual sport. And that means supporting all hunting. 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 That whether that's duck hunting, elk hunting, deer hunting, or turkey hunting. Or anything in between. Or anything in between. We are all in this for different reasons. And it's this difference that will be our undoing if we let it. It's imperative we stand together on issues regarding wildlife as a community and not from our individual perspective. So we need to come together as one pack and let our diversity be our strength. So we need to come together as one pack and let our diversity be our strength. So we need to come together and let our diversity be our strength. We are a strong force, but only if we band together. We are a strong force if we band together. One voice, one howl. 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 One voice, <laughs> one howl. So please, go check out howlforwildlife.org and start standing up for wildlife and your heritage. Join the pack, take action, make an impact together. All right. I didn't realize how long, long and annoying that was unless you're standing up here. I know you guys only paid attention when uh, Christy Titus was talking, but... Um, yeah, so basically what we've done is Howlful Wildlife has created a tool. So in the past, when you wanted to have your voice heard on a piece of legislation or uh, send your opinion into a game and fish department, you'd have to write your own email, you'd have to track down where that email goes to, so on and so forth. And let's just face it, nowadays, you know, especially with the internet, people do not take time to do anything. We can't even watch a, a video that's two minutes long without getting, you know, it, it's just, just the way of life. So what we've done is created the easy button for people and kind of eliminated those obstacles. So when you go to Howlful Wildlife, you can join, you can join as a free member. We don't want to alienate anybody. So if you don't want to have one of the paid memberships, it's fine. Become a free member. You could still take action. Your voice can still be heard. And that's what we want. Um, you go to the Action Center. And uh, for instance, there is a California hog hunting one right now that's on there, just off the top of my head. You go on there, you click on that. It gives you all the you know, information about it. And there's a pre-drafted email that is different for every person who goes to it. Yeah, so, and it's editable. You can go in there and edit it, add your own voice to it, add your own talking points to it, and you click send, 
and it will send it to all the decision makers that are associated with that bill, whether it's one person, or right now we have a bill in New York that we're working on, I think it's 156 people. So are you gonna send the 156 emails? Probably not, right? It's just too time consuming, we're busy, but with the click of a button, boom, it sends off 156 different emails to, with di different subject lines, and it's whitelisted, gets to their inbox, Almost everybody gets a response back from those, uh, you know, congressmen or, or senators or commission officers and so on and so forth. Uh, and you know that your voice is heard. It's a great way to um, unite and it's a great, we've, we've had so much success with it. This year alone, uh, we have either progressed forward or won every single bill that we have been associated with. And I think that's amazing. We have, one of the other things that we're doing is we're organizing people when, like so for instance, we had a game and fish meeting here for the, there was a, uh, a petition for um, banning bear hunting, lion hunting, and bobcat hunting here in Arizona. I don't know if you guys are aware of it or not, but we had a Zoom meeting you can go to Halifa Wildlife, you look on the calendar if there's a Zoom meeting or something, you join the Zoom meeting. And in that meeting, we sat there and we told you guys all the talking points, we educated you on all the, um, the procedures of, the, of the, the meeting and so on and so forth, so that when you showed up, you had something intelligent to say, you had something uh, that was going to be recognized and, and heard by the actual commission. And we've done this now on, I think about six or seven different meetings this year. And every single meeting, we outnumbered the anti-hunting. And we've been told by the, those Game and Fish Commissions or the, or the uh, committees that were overseeing the, these meetings that it was the first time ever that they saw hunters outnumbering anti-hunting. And it was a really positive, powerful thing to see, and we've just been steamrolling it. So um, I encourage you guys to go check out Halfa Wildlife. It's halfawildlife.org, and become a free member or become a member, full member. It's great. Uh, there's a lot of cool things associated with that. I won't get into that right now because um, I can see you guys are all glassing over already. And we're going to uh, get to the, uh, the coyote hunting stuff. All right. Oh, here I am. Cool. So, <clears throat> I like to bow hunt. I like to bow hunt predators. Um, I enjoy firearm hunting. If I'm going to hunt for predators, I typically use a shotgun. I like the idea of bringing them in close. I like that style of hunting. So, I've kind of developed my whole uh, philosophy on hunting that way when it comes to calling animals. And one of the things that I realized a long time ago, see, I actually got into bow hunting predators to up my bow hunting game, okay? Um, as you know, there's not much to do here in the summertime, in the spring, you know, there's not a whole lot of hunting. And so I'm like, what can I do to continue hunting with my bow and to get you know, more proficient with my bow at, as I was growing up. And predators was the thing. I was like, okay, cool, I could go, I could go predator hunt. It, at the time too, I was trying to get better with my camera skills. I'm like, oh cool, I could run the camera and I could do this. You know, it, was, it was just a really good tool to have. And I was equating it to I used to go back east a lot. I'm actually from New York, if you didn't hear the accent. I, I've been living here since 1991, so, which was a way, way longer than I lived there. Um, but I'd go back east, or I'd go to the Midwest, and I'd go tree stand hunt whitetails in the, in the rut. And it was like a drive-by shooting. Buck would come chasing a doe, you know, you bat at it, you know, and then you hope that it stops. And sometimes they'd give you a couple seconds, and sometimes they wouldn't but it's not conducive to the way we train as, as archers, right? Most of the time, if you're, you're 
bow uh, practicing, you're standing in front of a bag, you're perfect archer's tee, you're waiting, you're finding your pin, and blah, 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 you're shooting. But that's not hunting. That's not how hunting is. It's way sped up. It's way faster than that. So I wanted a tool to help me get faster, shot acquisition, getting the shot off. And, you know, a lot of people be like, oh, that's going to cause you to become a, you know, target paddock, a trigger puncher, da, 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 da. But for me, I think hunting is target panic. You know, everything about it is like, yeah, maybe if you're long distance hunting and you're, you know, sitting five, 600 yards away from it has no clue, no chance of you getting busted. You have all the time in the world. Little different story. Um, but when you're dealing with 100 yards or less, it's a, you know, I think it's a lot more intense of a, of a situation. Um, anyway, so that's how I got into bow hunting for predators. And I made a realization that, and if you've ever heard my elk seminar, you're going to hear a lot of the same some of the same techniques because I found that the commonality that links all calling of any animal, turkey, elk, deer, doesn't matter, um, is that there's a hangout point. There is a, there's a point that, um, that they get to that they want to see whatever it is that's calling to them. And we're going to get to that. So before... I get into the mechanics of what I do. I want to start off by talking about um, being low impact. And what does that mean? Um, it means trying, okay, I gotta back this up. So when I enter into a stand, the predator stand, I think of it as I'm stalking a deer. I want to be as quiet as possible. I want to stay out of sight. Uh, I don't skyline myself. I take the most concealed approach I possibly can. I work on my scent, you know, being scent free. I know that might be something that came from the whitetail woods for me, but I carried it all through and it's worked for me. Elk hunting, mule deer hunting, predator hunting, whatever. I always keep in mind wind direction and not just wind direction of me approaching, but wind direction of what how my setup is going to be. And you're going to see how this plays in, into it here when I get into this. But even I don't even leave the truck in sight. I, I, I hide my truck. So I try to, again, try to be as low impact as possible. Okay. Um, I'm going to get into the commonality of all calling, which I just kind of touched on right before I got into this. That is the point that an animal... Um, an animal gets to a point where it's the hang-up spot. It's, it's where they get to a point where they want to see what is calling from them. And I've heard a lot of people in the industry talk about this. Um, a buddy of mine, Chris Rowe, I think puts it the best. He, he, he equates it with his, with his wife. So if you were downstairs and your wife was calling to you upstairs in a room, you know, you'd go upstairs, you'd get to that room where you thought she was calling from, and you'd look into the room, and if you didn't see her, you'd be like, Hey, babe. And if she answered back from the room and you didn't see her, you would think, whoa, something's weird here. Something's fishy, right? Like, something's wrong. You're not going to go running into the room because you hear her voice, but you can't see her. And animals do the same thing. They get to a point where they want to see what it is that's making that noise. And that goes for distress calls. That goes for, you know, cow calling, bugling, the whole nine yard turkey calling, all of that. Um, and I know what a lot of you guys are thinking right off the top of your head, decoy, right? Like eliminate that, put something where they, they can see. I never use decoys. I shouldn't say never. I use decoys, turkey hunting. I use decoys while I'm deer hunting, but usually to go from place to place, not necessarily to call to, excuse me. Um, so it, what we need to do is we need to, we need to build a room. Okay. Um, and we need to, oh, we got to build in a room already. I said it, but that's not what I wanted to say. <laughs> Control the story actually. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to to start thinking about 
controlling the story. And what does that mean? It means think about what you're trying to communicate to the animal that you're calling, okay? Think about what they may hear, um, what they want to hear along with the sounds that you're making. Um, and and well, how can I put this? So I'm going to bring this back to whitetail hunting again. One of the things I used to talk about all the time was, you know, everybody knows rattling, grunt calling, bleeding. You've all seen that on TV, so on and so forth. So I learned from a guy years ago that if you create the illusion, what, so when you rattle, what else do you hear when you rattle? Well, you hear two bucks rustling around in the leaves, right? They're making a bunch of noise, they're breaking branches. It's not just antlers hitting. So one of the things, that, and they would be, they'll be grunting at each other, so one of the things I used to do is stick a grunt tube in my mouth, I'd rattle. i tie a rope to the end of my tree stand and tie it to a branch down in the leaves, and I would lift that up, and so the branches and stuff would break. So I want you to think about creating the whole, the whole illusion. And in, when in terms of coyote hunting, okay, that is what, what are you going to, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to call them with a, um, with a prey sound? Are you trying to use coyote sounds? What time of the year it is? Um, this is about the only time you're going to actually hear me talk about actual calling technique. Um, and it's, it's more about principles of how to do this, not necessarily uh, how to call when everybody comes and asks me there oh what calls do you use what sound do you use and how long are you calling for like honestly that stuff don't really matter I can record a baby crying and throw it out there and someone and I'll get a coyote to come in um, it's it's not the sound as how it's presented where it's presented and uh, for what I do for bow hunting it's how it's the setup the setup's the most important thing but Back up, backing up a little bit. So, when I'm when I'm going to call, I try to think about as many factors as I can control one, and as many factors that is going on. And and how can I put this? So, if I'm going to call, let's say in Flagstaff, I'm probably not going to use a jackrabbit in the stress call because in the pine trees and so on and so forth, there's not that many jackrabbits. But there's a crap ton of squirrels, there's fox, there's a lot of cottontails, some places have hares, you know, so think about that stuff. Like, I know I just said you could call one in with a baby and it really doesn't matter, but you could stack the odds in your favor by thinking about what it is that they expect to hear and how they expect to hear it. Um, I'll give you a quick, uh, story. So last year I took out a client and it was, it's that time of year where it was March, beginning of March, which is really tough to call coyotes in at that time because they, they got breeding on the brain. So if you're not really familiar with how to use uh, coyote sounds, they don't really come into prey sounds very much. One of the things that I've done in the past, because I know that is the case I what I did on this with this guy is I would start the start the sequence off with pup in distress oh excuse me let me back up I'd start the sequence off with a, a lone female howl and just to let them know hey, there's a female over here okay then I would do some growling and then I would switch to like a pup in the stress sound or, and it w I use a Fox Pro Fusion, so I change the, the pitch a lot and I'll make it like a lot of, so it doesn't sound like a baby, like a baby baby, it sounds like a younger female usually. And then that's what worked. That's the only thing that worked all day long. I didn't, I didn't even think about it till we were like later on in the day and I was like, oh, well, you know, I need to start doing something different because we're not calling things in with prey sounds. So it's, it's thinking about that stuff. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is being on the other side of the call. And what I mean by that is in order for you to pick, a, pick the right setup, you have to think about 
how the animal is going to come in and use the landscape that's in front of you. So, you know, some of that's going to come with experience. As you've called things in, you watch things come in, you see how they come in and how they react to the call and how they react to the, to the surrounding. But you could also think about it how you would do it. If you were going to come running to that call, you probably, as a human being, you probably wouldn't use the wind, but use the wind, okay? You're going to use the wind, but you're going you're gonna to avoid the landscape. You're going to take that path of least resistance. Almost all animals take the path of the least resistance, for the most part. Um, they're very in tuned and keyed into energy conservation. So they're going to go with, they're going to go the way that's the easiest for them. Um, and you also have to think about, we're going to go back to that, to that room thing. Where are they going to get to? Which point are they going to get to where they can see, or they should feel like they're going to be able to see the noise that's coming, that the noise that you're making, whether that's hand calling or with a, or with an electronic call. I don't like to hand call because, like I said, I bow hunt, but uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot harder. It's a lot easier to get busted because you're calling a person, you're calling the animal right to your locale versus away from you. Um, but there, there's always the same thing. Like, they always want to come to a point. So if I'm, like, right now in this room, okay, we got these row of chairs here, and I got this open, this open lane, and if I was sitting right in the back, you know, up against that wall, and a coyote comes running up here, they got a free, clear view of that. So he could stop right here. He doesn't have to keep on coming. And, you know, in this situation, that's a, you know, no-brainer, easy shot. It's only 10 yards or whatever. But, you know, if it's further away, he's not going to keep on coming because he's like, okay, I don't see anything over there. Yeah, if I had a DK, decoy spinning, he might entice him to come, but it might not. Um, so you got to think about those things. Think about how it's set up and how, how you'd want to, uh, or how he would come in. Okay, so that brings me to the room. And basically, we're going to build, we're going to build a room here. And um, I'm actually going to have you pass through that one slide that says the room and just go straight to the, to the picture because I kind of went over most of that. Okay, so this is a really grainy and crappy photo that I used for an article that I wrote like 10 years ago. Um, it doesn't show up on here real good, but you can see here, sort of, there's a thick line of trees. This is a wash, right? And this is a, a, a boulder outcropping, basically, okay? This is another wash, real thick here, real thick here, okay? I'm showing you that the wind direction was going this way, okay? Me, the hunter, I'm set up here, okay? And this is a large enough structure to hide. We're going to call that the hide. If you're using, I'm going to primarily talk about using uh, electronic call because most of us will be doing that, I would imagine. Um, and I'll tell you how to do it if you were hand calling. It's a little different setup. But with, with an electronic call, you want to, whatever sound you're making, the structure has to be large enough to hide that animal that's making the sound. So obviously if you're using a rabbit sound, it doesn't have to be giant, but you want it to be big enough that a predator has to come around the front of it to see the sound, which would ultimately, in this setup, so if you're here, you had the call coming here, I was, I was betting that most of the animals would either come from here using the funnel, with using the wind in their favor, okay? Or if they did came, come from this side, then I didn't have a problem with the wind at all, but they're still gonna come across here and come to the front Typically, they come right, almost right to the call, if not always, almost always to the call um, in a situation like this because they have to get close enough to see it. So they come around and they present a, uh, a broadside shot. Most of the time, I had my fair share. You'll see in a video that I brought with me um, where I, I shot it, a frontal shot, whatever. But that happens a lot too. 
but more than likely they're going to present you with a shot, and that's the important part, right? Um, I'm going to kind of open it up to questions real quick before I keep going because I feel like I'm rambling on here. Does anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? No? Yes? Oh, okay. So when I'm bow hunting or shotgun hunting, I like to have the call within 30 yards of me. And that, that, you can limit that to whatever you feel your effective range is, okay? Um, you know, if we were talking about rifle hunting at this point, that room could be way bigger. You know, if you only need a coyote to come into 200 yards to shoot it, then that's how big your room is. So whatever your, so for me, when I coyote hunt, I like to limit everything 50 yards or less when I'm, when I'm predator hunting. I, you know, when I deer hunt and elk hunt, that's a different story. I have, a, I have different distances. But predator hunting, I try to keep it within 50 yards. And I try to get all my shots between 20 and 30 yards. And I do that by picking really tight, um, really tight rooms, okay? Really tight spaces where I know that I will see them coming probably 50, 60 yards, but they have to keep on coming to 20 or 30 yards for me to make the shot and for them to see the call or what, what, what they think is calling to them, okay? Anybody else? I saw another hand go up somewhere. Same question? Okay, cool. All right. I got a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry, you passed around. So in this scenario, would uh -huh. there be any difference between a coyote, fox, bobcat, or mountain lion in this scenario? And if you're going for one of those four species, would you set up differently or there be a time difference where you would give up? Um, Yes. Yes and no. So the setup, the components of the setup are all the same. Now, if I was lion, looking for a lion, uh, and now I've, I've, to be perfectly honest with you, I've only called in three in 30 years of calling. Um, but I also don't target lion country that much for predator hunting. Um, I would just pick a different area, something that is more, typically more koozie has, you know, more koozie deer country has more, more higher chance of a lion coming in versus your, your mule deer flats or, or something like that. Um, for a fox, exactly the same setup. Bobcat, exactly the same setup as a, as a coyote. Again, it might, if I was targeting that animal, I might just choose different areas. Uh, the, the difference that when I'm trying to call in cats versus foxes or, or, you know, um, or coyotes is the length of time. I very rarely spend more than 15 minutes on a stand if I'm coyote hunting or, or fox hunting. But if I'm bobcat and lion hunting, I might stretch that out to even double that sometimes, 30. Uh, also with bear. I've called in several bear. I've killed a couple bear here in Arizona um, using the same principles. Um, the thing about bear that differs from um, from the rest of the predators is if you stop calling, bear usually stop coming, and they may not start back coming. If you you know, like they'll lose interest really quick. They're like, oh, squirrel, you know, and you know, start eating on acorns or something, and forget about whatever was that. And the one thing I noticed. The more annoying the sound, the higher pitched, annoying screaming the sound, the better chance you have of a bear coming to respond to it versus, um, you know, using more traditional sounds from, for the predator, other predators. So, did that answer your question? Okay, good. I'm not the greatest presenter in the whole world, so. Yeah, that's. Um, Go ahead. I was trying to, oh, there's, yeah, that's great. So you kind of touched on the calling sequence and to keep calling. So what's the time between the calls? So is it just letting it, the fox pro run or are you doing like a 30 seconds between it starts back up, a minute, three minutes, five minutes? Yeah. Is, there a, is there a timeline before it's making the scream noise or whatever you're choosing for that sound? Again, if I'm in, if I'm in coyote country and fox country and I'm trying to like target those type of animals, I very rarely stop the call. Like, there's, I might change the sounds, but I very rarely uh, stop calling. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, like I said, I, I mostly bow hunt. 
So I don't want to be fidgeting around with my collar and messing around. You know, I want to spend my time looking and remembering my yardages. Um, I should probably tell you about that. If you're, if you're planning on trying bow hunting, okay, I figured most people probably weren't going to try the bow hunting thing, but you guys wanted to shoot them with shotguns. But if you're going to do bow hunting, the first thing you do when you sit down is take your rangefinder and range as many um, landmarks as that you can remember and remember those ranges and just as you're looking back and forth, panning back and forth, every time you hit those, you say, oh, 56 yards, 35 yards, da 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 That way, when you know the coyote comes in, uh, it's great training for elk hunting. You call in an elk, you know, he's coming in, you draw back, and you're like, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Oh, crap, he's walking, and he's coming closer, and now I don't know what range he's at because I ranged that him when he was behind the tree over there before I drew back, and it's kind of a really good uh, way to, you know, well, how we used to hunt, <laughs> you know, before we had range hunt finders. But um, I, I try to play that game with myself and try to remember every single thing. So that's, a, that's a one thing you guys should be doing for sure if you sit down. Um, we're going to go to a, another photo here that I have uh, of the room. Let's see. I think that's, yep, that one. Okay, this is an actual, so is that other one. This is an actual setup. And I believe right after this, I have the video of this very same setup of me calling in a coyote. Um, so again, here we have, this is blown up. It's a little bit nicer, easier to see. I am in this tree. I've basically made myself a ground blind. You know, I kind of break some branches. Don't be afraid about breaking branches. I've actually called in coyotes breaking branches and making a commotion because they think something's going on and they want to know what's going on here. Um, break some branches. I got in, you know, backed myself into the, into the tree and I got myself set up. I got my shoulder pointing to where the call is at. That, and I do that because it gives me the most uh, range of motion, right? Okay. I set the call. Typically, I try to look for a setup that's a little offset. And what I mean by that is slightly to my strong side when I'm bow hunting. Shotgun hunting, you know, rifle hunting, I don't think it's as, as important because when you swing, you, it's, not, it's easier to swing with a rifle or, or, a, or a shotgun especially uh, than I think it is with a bow. So I try to do that. And the other reason why I try to do that is I set it up with the wind direction. Now this one, the wind direction was going this way. Uh, I don't know why I didn't put an arrow here, but the wind direction was going this way. So I had a feeling they were gonna come from this side and, and come around. What my hope was they were gonna come past me, right? And as they pass me, give me the opportunity to draw, because now I'm out of the periphery, and come to the call and stop for the couple of seconds that it needs me to, to, to get off a shot. Um, When I came into this room, okay, if you could see the room here, let's look at it again. Uh, this is super thick, right? So I know they have to cross this. This is a wash. I know they have to cross this at least to see the call. And once they've crossed this, as they're running, I should be able to see them now. They won't be able to see me, but I should be able to see them. That gives me, okay, now I know where I'm gonna be pulling my, or I might even draw the bow back already. It gives me an opportunity, but they still this big, dense structure here that is blocking their view from the sound of the call. They're going to have to either come around this way, come around. So no matter which direction they come at, even if they come from behind me, which happens sometimes, you know, you try to, you try to make a setup that they're not going to do that. But if he comes from behind me, he still has to come across in front of me, and he won't see me because of the, the structure that I'm in, right? Okay. Um, Actually, let's just go to that video real quick. And what I want to point out here is, see where that coyote just went to? There's actually a coyote already down. I forgot to hit, see him flopping around right there. I had just shot the coyote. And you can see him running back and forth all over. See this other coyote here on the left? That's the one I just shot right there with my bow. But this one I had shot um, previously before hit record. because. Sometimes I forget to do that. Um, 
after I, sh I called him in first, okay? It was a single. I started off the, I started off the, we can play that again I'll, I'll, real slow and I'll kind of go through it. But I started off the sequence here with a prey distress. And as soon as I shot him, I quickly switched to Ky a coyote pup distress. Called him the whole pack. As you can see, they're dive bombing from every direction. There was almost too many. It was like too target rich. I couldn't decide which one I wanted to shoot. And, and that kind of messed me up. Um, I ended up shooting three on this, uh, on this video, but you can't see it because the other one's off screen here somewhere. But as you can see, that sex had that really dense structure right here. And you had this low ground cover, which you know stops you from shooting. Like that guy came in, it's like I could have shot him probably on the move through here. That was only 15 yards. That thing's only 20 yards from me. I think it was 18. Um, I shot that, at, I think it was at 35 or 40, 35 yards, something like that. It wasn't very far. Um, but you can, you can kind of get an idea. It's not the greatest film, but you get an idea. You could tell like I'm in a blind, I'm really concealed. You can see my bow because I have the way I have it set up uh, with the tripod in front of me. But they had to go look over there. And then of course, after I shot the coyote and he was flopping around, I had a decoy, a live decoy, and he was, actually squealing too a little bit, so that kind of helped me out, you know? But that, that, that's one setup right here. Um, any questions? Okay. Does it matter when you're setting up the way that, or do you have a way to uh, place the speaker? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know hey, what? Let, let anybody that's asking a question, please let's put it on the mic because that oh, yeah, way sure. the people at home can uh, hear it as well. Does the way that you... Very important. Place, okay. So, just like the wind, I'm, I'm always trying to direct where I want the coyotes to come from. And I noticed years ago that, especially like on a Fox Pro style where you have a horn and then you have a, like a speaker on the backside, if you place the horn in a, in a direction, nine times out of ten, that's the side they're going to come from. I don't know if it's because of the directional sound going that way, or maybe not nine times, let's say seven times out of 10. But it helps a lot, so I like to stack everything in my favor. I put the speaker typically in the wind direction. And the reason why I do that, and I, I mean, I don't always do that, because sometimes like, I'll point it in the direction where I think coyotes are at, and that's a whole different, you know, you know finding where coyotes are at, what, where, where they might hide, that's a whole different seminar in itself. But um, I point it in the direction with the wind typically so that way I'm almost forcing them like I'm giving them two reasons to come from that direction and if I had you know I had that other slide up I didn't really talk about the funnel very much but if I have a structural funnel and I have the wind coming that way and I have the speaker going that way pretty good chance they're gonna come from that way you know it's not exact science they can come from wherever yeah right here here you go so like this funnel, I, when, I set this, when I go sit in this spot right here, and I've sat it a few times, I want to say better than 50% of the time, they're going to come the way, the way that I think they would, which was from here. So um, there was like five other hands went up there. So I don't know if we got... As far as volume, when you sit on the call, are you starting at like a 50% volume or do you just leave it one volume for the whole 15 minute set? Um, yes, <laughs> I've, done it, I've done it all. Um, and I'm not quite sure I'm convinced that any one way is better. I think maybe slightly I'm, I'm leaning to, I generally start, so like I'll use a Fox Pro, I'll start at like 20, but I'll only keep it there for a minute before I go up to 30 and then maybe a minute and a minute or so or more and then I go up to 38 which is just below full the reason why I don't go full volume is I think it sounds a little distorted and I think predators pick up on that um, there and, and, I, and I think for me the reason why some of my success has gone up doing it that way is that I'm really 
I've been really good about picking spots where I think coyotes are at already. I can't tell you how many times I've set the, turned the call on and within 20, 30 seconds I have a coyote on me. That, that, that video that we had up, I call that coyote in in seven seconds. I literally just turn it on. I almost didn't kill, I almost didn't kill him. If it wasn't for the fact that he spent a little bit more time at the bush, I would have missed. Um, and he was flopping around because I didn't make a great shot on him, obviously. Um, so if you start off low, if there's one close and it's too loud, I think sometimes you scare them off. That's about the only reason why I do that little, you know, ramping up. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this too. Another thing that I like to do, and this only works with calls that you have this functionality, um, is I mess with the pitch a lot. You know, if I'm calling for more than a few minutes and I haven't had something come in, I start ramping the pitch up and down, changing the set pitch a little bit. So it's not the same, because I mean, if you're calling for 15 minutes and you're for 15 minutes, one, it's annoying as all of you, right? But I, I, like to, I like to mess with the volume, I'll go up and down and I'll mess with the pitch too, to kind of create movement. Uh, some of these calls actually have, like I know Fox Pro that has the Fox Motion, it'll actually do that for you and switch from speaker to speaker and so on and so forth. I think we had there and then maybe back there was another one. What time of day was that? Um, it was early, pretty early morning. It was my second set, so I don't, I, I, I wanna say it was in October, so it was probably sometime before, probably around seven. Did you have one? <laughs> Guys. What was uh, the landmarks or the, the, the layout that got you to that area? I mean, was I'm there anything that gave it away or gave the, the location for them away? For oh, the why did I pick that spot? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I always look for a lot of intersecting, when I'm hunting flat stuff like that, I look for a lot of dense cover that meets up with not so dense cover and it has this like, you know, it's the same thing I do for deer, okay? You look for uh, juxtaposition, it's called, basically. What is, how is the water, the cover, the feed, well, in this case, it's not feed, it's where you might find rabbits or something that a, a, a coyote would hunt, right? Where, where would these things be hiding? And how are they gonna use the landscape to get to those? How do they hunt it? And you'll see it, you, you know, you go out and scouting, you're like, oh, okay, there's coyote tracks in this wash. Or, you know, there's, there's cat scratch poop here and there's, you know, fox pooping on a rock there. And you kind of look at these things. So fox ha ends up being the easiest, okay? Let me, let's talk about fox for a second. So if I'm targeting fox, I typically look for a lot of boulders, look for a lot of rocks, look for a place that they can escape their mortal enemy, which happens to be a coyote. And, um, and those nine times out of 10, if you go to a really rocky bluff that is surrounded by a lot of vegetation that holds a lot of rabbits and small, uh, small game, you're probably gonna find a fox there. Um, and so when I look for coyote spots, especially, uh, I like these like, you know, uh, mesquite flats or, you know, Palo, Palo Verde flats or whatever uh, when I'm up here hunting in Phoenix area. Um, but I look for a lot of where washes are gonna meet each other, where they're gonna cross, you know, cross each other and create habitat that is suitable to the coyote. I hopefully that answered your question. I'm trying not to be vague, but sometimes it's hard for me to paint the picture. Um, anybody else? Before we, right there. Uh, <coughs> you know, out in, in an area where, where, where there's a lot of fawning doves. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. How about in an area where there's a lot of fawning doves? An area with a lot of, I'm sorry. Fawning does. Fawning does, yes, excellent, excellent. So that's a, 
one of the, my favorite times a year to go out is when the, when the you know, the fawns are dropping. Um, and so that's a perfect example of what we were talking about earlier, thinking about what they may, may or may not expect at that time of year. So those are great places to go start using a fawn ball or fawn distress type calls. And, um, and setting up locations that would be close to where fawns would normally be hiding from predators. Um, but yeah, no, that's an excellent, that's an excellent thing to look for, you know, and that's a great time of year to go. Also, one of the most effective times a year for, as a management tool. So the best time of year for us to take coyotes off the landscape is when the does and uh, calves are dropping. And, um, sorry, fawns, not does, um, are dropping. And like when I was doing hunting land consulting, that's one of the things you do. You go out, you don't need to shoot coyotes all year round. You just, you, you hit them hard when that, that is occurring and that helps those deer get past a certain age where they can run away and, and so on and so forth and helps your deer herd out. Um, I think I'm gonna bring you guys to, I have another video. This is actually a video where I was considering doing this as a, uh, as a DVD. Oh, here we go. Uh, we'll, we'll let this one roll and then I'll kind of, I go through the mechanics on this. I'll actually explain the situation. I'll show you my blind. I walk you out to the, to the call where I go and then you see the coyote and all that stuff. So we'll let that roll. We'll see if there's any questions and I'll explain that a little bit better. I put it right in front of his chest. It came out. See, so yeah, I put it right there. That's the entrance. It came out right there. Stand number one for the morning. That's actually a female. Dunzo. Actually, that is the wrong video. How did I give you that one? Um, oh. No, actually, not, it's not this video either. I don't think it's on that PowerPoint real quick. I'm going to look real quick on my, uh, on my desk here and see if I have it. Man, that sucks. I really wanted to show you guys that. Well, okay, I'll try to explain it to you. So this, this setup is I'm at the front face of a, of a wash, and the washes come together like this, okay? And that's over here to the left. Those washes come together. The wind is going from my right to left. Um, the road that I came in on is kind of behind me, and and so and the and the direction that I'm facing, the road is at like 4:30, okay, and that's the way I came in. So I had a good idea that they that they weren't going to come from there because the road's behind me, um, and because I walked through there, if I ran into a coyote, I probably would have spooked it. Um, we talked about looking or locating what's good country or what's good habitat. So those little washes as where coyotes will lay, it lay down. It's where they're going to be hunting for, for rabbit on those edges because that's where the water is here in Arizona, right? That's where it goes to. So the grass is always, but the vegetation all along, it's always better. And that's where the rabbits are gonna be eating. Where the rabbits are gonna be eating, that's where the coyotes are gonna be eating. It's pretty, pretty simple uh, concept. But anyway, so I set the call out here. I had it facing in this direction. And that coyote, you don't, it's hard to see in this video because one, my cousin Anthony is a terrible, uh, terrible with the camera, but he uh and he didn't see it coming but it came from behind here and it ran and it did like a half moon circle it was coming to right there and he stopped right there i had the call was in that bush right there okay so when he came he stopped where he thought he should be able to see it wasn't a big enough structure wasn't a dense enough structure i thought it was good enough to hide a rabbit which was what i was using um, 
but it, he still got to a point where he's like, I should see some commotion. I don't even see sticks moving, or I don't see the bushes moving. I don't see anything happening. I don't see a hawk trying to, you know, take a rabbit or anything, but it was still within my kill zone, right? And that was, that's the point. That is exact what, what, what I've been trying to hit home here is I, he had to come at least that close to figure out that something wasn't right. And one, it made him pause right there. And two, it, like I said, he was already in my kill shot. So I don't know if you want to roll that again, you can. And then we'll go to the... I wow. So he basically the stopped on the back side of that, of where the call was. Not necessarily on the back side of it, but he was beyond it. So, um, anybody have any questions? Oh, yes? Oh, good. Okay. Um, this next video I'm going to show you is me with a client. Okay. Uh, and I apologize. I, I curse on this a little bit. So. You might hear that. And that's the, um, again, similar setup. We're in dense cover. I got good cover. Coyotes coming across. Stops right there. Looks right at the call and then takes off. He was already at full draw. He didn't shoot. He was afraid to shoot because there were some a little bit of bushes there. And as any ethical deer hunter or elk hunter or whatever bow hunter can you don't shoot through that stuff but when it comes to coyotes i have a philosophy if you got a shot take it right um i don't know if everybody shares that with me but that's that's kind of my philosophy and i i not because most of the time when you shoot them they will try to fight with whatever just hit them so you usually have enough time to put another arrow in and shoot it again. Um, so the, again, not the greatest video, hoping, hoping to, sh to try to paint the picture here, but this was, the wind was coming this way, okay? I had a funnel of trees. I had my whole row of trees. I had this whole row of trees here, or, or dense bushes or whatever you want to call it, mostly creosote and, and Palo Verde. So, and then we had all this low cover, you know, which is what prevented him from shooting. Ultimately, it was 18 yards. I wish he would have, but he didn't. Um, it, it was a, it's basically a funnel, okay? It's like, like on that other picture I showed, it's basically a funnel. And I had the call facing that way, the winds coming this way. And honestly, in this particular layout, I wasn't 100% sure which way they would come from because that way there was houses like a little, like a quarter mile that way. So I, I wasn't 100% sure, but if it's early enough in the morning, if there's houses in a direction, I'm almost calling always, almost always calling towards the houses because I know <laughs> that coyotes are hanging out, picking off rabbits and people's landscaping and people's dogs in their backyard and cats and so on and so forth. Um, this was a late morning. This was already like 11 a.m. So I wasn't convinced that we were going to get something to come from that direction, but I had a play to that direction because the wind was going that way and the funnel worked to my advantage that way. But in my head, I was still worried that they were going to come from this side um, where they might be betting. So... I took a chance, I swung really far around that they might be betting in some of this stuff that was, you know, attached to these, and I made the setup here. It worked out, but obviously we didn't get it. But, um, you know, those are the things you, you look at. You, you should try to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Anything that you could stack in your odd, in the odds in your favor, anything that you can do to direct, going back to what I said earlier, direct the... Um, the story or the narrative, if you, if you will, of the situation. Um, and you do that with sound, you do that with wind, you do that with the vegetation, the landscape, and try to put all those pieces together. Um, and hopefully I explain why you would, what, why and how to look for those things well enough. But uh, if I didn't and you have any other questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to answer that now, actually. 
Um, it was in this, uh, in this, right in front of this big creosote. It was a big, dense deal. And there was probably that, that tall, you know, brush in front of it. So I knew he really had to go right to it. He literally went to it, stuck his nose in it, smelt, probably smelt me, my hands on it, and that's when he turned around. A lot of times when you're bow hunting or, or shotgun and whatever in this type of setup, if they come all the way to the call, if they come all the way to the call, you only have, you know, a second or two. So if you're at full draw and he stops, whatever angle you got, send it. You know? Uh, any other questions? No? Okay. Oh, John? Uh, when you're using shotguns, are you using buckshot or using birdshot, like fours, twos? Yes. <laughs> no. Uh, my favorite is, I've, I've tried them all. Uh, I found that double odd buck with my gun and my setup tends to be the most forgiving, the most deadly. Um, if you're targeting fox, I tend to drop down to fours uh, because I've, <laughs> I've had them a, a little further than I probably should have shot. And, um, you know, you only hit them with one pellet. They flip around and then they take off and run in and you lose one. And that's, you know, nobody wants that. So, yes, sir. Um, typically, I'm shooting mechanicals, and mainly because they, and I, I, I shoot the Schwacker two inch, two blade, because it creates more shock. Because I know it's not going to, if I'm, I know I'm not always going to have that perfect shot. I'm not always going to have that, uh, you know, double long broadside or heart shot or whatever the case may be. So I want it to cause enough shock that it anchors them. And like I said before, usually you hit them with something like that, they flop around, and you, a lot of times you'll have a chance to shoot them again if it wasn't a good shot to begin with. Um, every time I've shot one with a fixed blade, they run off like a deer, and then I gotta go track them, and sometimes they get down a hole, or they get into stuff that you don't wanna go into. Um, so when it comes to coyotes, I typically use a, I use the mechanical. And one that creates one, a big hole, a lot of trauma, but also has a certain amount of shock value to it. Uh, some of them that are, the, you know, the mechanism doesn't open a certain way. I don't, I don't know if they would work as effective. Anyone else? No? Yes? Again? What happens when the blades don't open up? When the blades don't open up? I never had that problem. Never had that problem. Nope. No, and and the, and the reason, part of the reason why I use a Schwacker, is because it has two. It has a one-inch cut, even if it doesn't open. Uh, if it went straight through them, it has a one-inch cut, single bevel, and creates a big enough. You can. I've actually ran out of broadheads and used my practice broadhead, which has the same two sharpened bleeder blades. It just doesn't open, and I've killed coyotes with them before. So. But no, typically, so, I mean, if you're asking me about my elk setup or you're asking me, even though I've killed elk with, with mechanicals as well, um, I typically shoot a single bevel. Right now I'm shooting the Iron Will, uh, 125 grain single bevel for deer and for elk. So, but when it comes to coyotes, I've had more success um, with them not getting away and with anchoring them with a... Uh, with a mechanical. I guess that's it for me. I've uh, kind of, I think I got through everything that I wanted to. I bounced around a little bit more than I wanted to, so I don't know if I got it. I covered everything. Uh, hopefully you guys have a better understanding of, of predator hunting or uh, at least uh, setups for predator hunting. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Let's give another round of applause for John Stallone, you guys.
John, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we've been trying to get him, like I said, for a long time. He's very well known. Check out his podcasts and stuff. And uh, he's into a lot of different hunting related stuff. Uh, very highly respected and well known throughout the United States. With that, guys, um, we've still got, I think, a little bit of pizza and stuff out there, but we're going to go ahead and jump right into the raffles. We will actually uh, be getting those ready here in just a few minutes. If anybody wants to get in on some of the raffles, you still have just a little bit of time, and then we're going to be drawing for that stuff here in just a few minutes. We will actually draw that stuff uh, out there where the raffle stuff is at. So. Uh, everybody, you guys, uh, grab a snack and stuff, and then let's give some stuff away.